faithfulness. Hallelujah. We give you glory tonight. We give you honor tonight. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you for your holiness, Father. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy, Father, that you have released upon our lives, Lord God. We thank you for it. We bless you in this place, Father. We honor you. Hallelujah. Just give him some glory. Just thank him. Thank him for your healing. You thank him ahead of time. Thank him for your deliverance. Come on. Thank him for your miracle. Hallelujah. He's a God of miracles. He is a God of miracles. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the God of miracles, the God of healing, the God of deliverance. Hallelujah. He's our sustainer. He's everything. He's Jehovah Gabor. He's going to contend for you this weekend. Hallelujah. He's our contender. And he defeated the enemy of your soul. Hallelujah. And he gave us victory by his Holy Spirit and his blood. We thank you, Father. We give you glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's a good, good God, isn't he? He's a good, good God. Hallelujah. We thank you. So you may be seated in this beautiful presence of the Lord. And we know we can stay there all night right there. <laughs> yeah. It's wonderful to be able to, to feel the presence of God. So many people can't feel him and don't know him. And, and so we just thank God that we know him. He is alive. Amen. Alive forevermore. And so welcome to session one of spiritual cleansing. And so we believe that deliverance is a children's bread. Healing is our bread. We believe in miracles. Hallelujah. And we believe that God's going to move mightily in your life on these two days. Amen. And so tonight, um, just going to be led by the Holy Spirit. And so on the way here, and it, it's so awesome how God confirms everything. And so I'm going to talk about healing waters. I'm going to talk about the spirit of grief. I'm going to teach about that and also blocks to healing. And so, you know, healing is ours. Amen. And so when the Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, and I'm sure some of you know that that word saved means sozo. It means we shall be preserved. We shall be delivered. We shall be healed. We shall have a sound mind. Right. So he's not just talking about our salvation, our spirit being saved, our soul, but our bodies. Okay, preserves totality in being. And so cleansing is about wholeness. It's about being whole. And so there's there's things in us many times that we are unaware of and we don't even know. And even even the teachings that are released are just tailor made for the people that come. And so it always comes out a different way. And so your booklets are yours to take home, and we have online for those that are watching. There's a PDF file on the website. You're, you're welcome to download that, uh, to share that, and use that. We may or may not get in. We probably get in the book a little bit. We might not tonight, but that is yours, and you should take it home, and you should read it and look up all those scriptures about the roots of rejection and fear and pride and all of those things, but tonight... He, he has me going a little different place, a little different direction uh, tonight. And so I want to talk about healing waters and, and deal with the spirit of grief that's in God's people. Amen. And so there are blocks to healing. And so a lot of people don't understand that and don't realize that. We teach that, that 80% of sicknesses, at least 80%, probably more, are spiritually rooted. Okay. And so you have to break the curse, release the spirit, and then healing can flow rather easily. And so, Father, we just thank you for this word tonight. I just thank you, Holy Spirit, that you would speak through this lips of clay tonight. Father, God, a word that they need to hear. And, Father, you gave it to me as I walked in. So, Father, I thank you, Lord God. You are so faithful. And I ask, Father, that it would minister to their ears, Father God. Their spiritual man would be in tune to what you're saying tonight. I thank you for the healing waters. I 
I thank you, Father, for freeing us from uh, grief, exposing areas where we have battled this spirit of grief for such a time as this, Father, and we just give you all the glory for it. We thank you for ministering angels, Father God, in this place in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you, Father God, that angels are actively involved in this weekend in the name of Jesus. Father, we release them. We ask that you would send them, Father, healing angels, ministering angels, angels of miracles, angels of breakthrough, Father, in the name of Jesus, Father. We thank you for it, Lord God. I thank you even as we teach that bodies are healed this weekend. We just thank you for the atmosphere of healing in this place, cleansing and healing, deliverance, miracles, Father, because your presence is here, Father, and let it extend into those that are hearing in the name of Jesus, because there is no limits to the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, I thank you that the Spirit of God touches those that are watching in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. And so blocks to healing. Let's talk about that a minute. And so the first one, and it ain't, this isn't, doesn't mean that this is the order, okay? But if you have notes or if you need a piece of paper, you should probably get one. Um, we have pens back there. We do a lot of teaching. We walk the word. It's very important that the word of God breaks up the fallow ground so you can receive what it is that God has for you. Amen. And so in these power encounters and deliverances, we always teach the word first. And then, and then we begin to minister the healing at the last session and deliverance. Well, healing will take place as we're teaching. But we like to do that because we want people to understand you know, and then after you leave this place and you get deliverance, you need to have some word in there to hold what you got, right? Deliverance is the easy part. Then you got to maintain. <laughs> and so uh, one of the areas is unbelief. There's a lot of unbelief in the body of Christ. And so unbelief, the Bible says that unbelief is evil. Hebrews says it's evil to have unbelief when, you're, when, you're, when you don't believe God. And so you have to get in the word. You have to get in the word when you're talking about a spirit of unbelief. We will deal with that and we'll do deliverance with that because it is a spiritual stronghold, believe it or not. And so unbelief can be a blocker for you to receive healing. All right. Also, the next thing is your negative confession. A negative confession. You you have you eat what you say. And so if you're always a negative confession, you're always confessing the problem, the sickness, instead of confessing the word of God on the diagnosis or the issue, you know, you're gonna have what you say. All right. And a negative confession will enforce unbelief and doubt. All right. It will do that. And if you keep saying it long enough, it will set up in your heart. And when it sets up in your heart, it becomes a stronghold. And so every area when I'm releasing these different blocks can become a stronghold in your soul, in your mind, in your heart. Same thing. And so you're made of three parts, your spirit, soul, and body. And so in the soul of man, the mind, the will, the emotions, that is where this stronghold gets set up in you. But unfortunately, when the soul is sick and the soul has a stronghold, it affects this physical house, okay? The physical body then begins be, gets sick, and so it breaks it down. That's what demons do. They come to still kill and destroy, right? Every area of your life, okay? They don't just want your mind. They want your body. They want your organs. Come on. They want your bones. They want to break down your systems. They want to, they want to hide in your immune system, hide in organs and in lungs and in the heart and all of those things. They're illegal when you're a child of God, because Jesus redeemed us from the curse and, and, and the curse of sickness and all of those things and oppression. And so with cleansing, we're just walking out the finished work of Jesus. That's all. We're applying the truth of God's word, the power and the authority of the anointing of Jesus that he gave us, right? And the blood. And all of that together frees and heals the person. Amen. And it's, it's our right to have these things. And so destroying the temple of God is the next thing. The Bible says don't give the devil a place, right? And so, you know, when, when we put things in the temple of God over and over again, something happens to the body. We know that. 
and that can be bad eating habits. It can be, you know, smoking. It can be too much, you know, the alcohol. It can be a, a drugs, whatever it is, you know, whatever you're putting into your body, toxic things. And we know, thank God, we need to pray and ask God to bless our, our water and our bread today because we don't know what they're putting in stuff, right? But we do need to pray over those things and, and listen to the Holy Spirit. See, he will help us cleanse this temple, okay? He, he's the helper. He's everything. He's the wisdom. And so God deals with us about destroying the temple of God. Many believers' lives are cut short because of a lack of knowledge or because of uh, carelessness or, or negligence, okay, in their bodies, And so the next area is unforgiveness. The spirit of unforgiveness will block your healing. All right. Hebrews 12, 15 talks about, and we will teach the last session on that stronghold, but it it says that bitterness defiles the body. It defiles us. It hinders, it blocks. And I find when people have unforgiveness in their heart, it's very, very difficult to get the demon out of them. You're going to wrestle with that spirit, all of that. Because it has a legal right to be there. Because unless you forgive, your father will not forgive you. It's pretty serious. The next thing is, is a lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6, and 7 says that God's people perish for what? A lack of knowledge. And so there's a, Christians today in the body of Christ don't even know, many don't even know spiritual warfare is real. Or that it exists. They're very passive with darkness. They're passive with the enemy. They allow trespassers in their life. They allow sicknesses and diseases and all of those things. And they just let that stuff come in and just tear their bodies down, right? And so a lack of knowledge. Many uh, churches don't teach about healing even. You know, it's not for today. It was, it was then. And miracles aren't real today. And all of those very sad but, but that's a block. You can't be healed unless you can, you can believe and claim the promise that Jesus is the healer, right? <laughs> you got to believe that. And so the next area is generational curses. And we will teach on bloodline tomorrow, generational curses. You will find that a generational curse can be in place and that can hinder the healing from flowing. All right. And, and also if say you do a working of miracles happens or the gift of healing takes place in your body, but yet you have a curse that is unseen and the person is releasing the healing. Sometimes people lose their healing because that thing is still there and it will, it will manifest itself again. All right. And so with cleansing, we want to get to the root the root issue, not surface. We want to go down deep into the root. That's the same way with uh, these hidden bloodline iniquities that we teach about. All of those things, um, those things need to be broken and and released from the people. Then the healing can stay. Another area is soul ties. It's very real. People can have an ungodly soul tie that can block their healing. We've seen it happen. Or if they do get a healing, but a physical healing, but their soul is still wounded, right? They have a, they have a broken place within them that has not been emotionally healed. The physical uh, sickness can manifest again, all right? Because it's an open door. It's very, very important that your soul is healthy, right? And then your body can remain healthy. Those are just a few areas. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so those are things that you can um, ask the Holy Spirit if there's places in your heart where these things are there. All right. And so let's keep on walking the word of God because it is the will of God to heal. You need to settle that. It is the will of God to heal you. It is the will of God to set you free. It is the will of God to do miracles. It is the will of God, period, okay? He is a God of miracles. And so God cannot show his love and 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 hold back power. He can show his power and hold back love. The power and the love of God work together. Hallelujah, (laughs) okay? And so the greatest barrier to the faith in many seeking healing is the uncertainty in their minds as it is the will of God or not. It's a question. 
I remember hearing people say when I was younger, well, if it's the Lord's will, maybe, you know, God will touch them. That's not the right way to pray. Amen. That's unbelief. That's double minded. That's fear. That can be that's doubt. You don't really believe what you're saying. So healing is provided for all. So we settle that in the atmosphere today. Right. And so it's impossible to boldly claim by faith a blessing that we are not sure God offers. It's like when you're in poverty, if you don't believe God wants to bless you with prosperity, you're not going to prosper. All right. You got it. You you if you don't believe those things, if you don't if you're not sure God wants to do it, how can you claim? How can you receive from the father? Amen. And so the power of God can be claimed only where the will of God is known. That's why you get in the word. The word of God will tell you the will of God for your life. Amen. And so you put the word of God on it. Amen. So faith begins where the will of God is known. <clears throat> Hallelujah, we got that settled, right? And I'm going to get into some more, but I just want to put those out there in this little foundation tonight. And so we thank God that it says that Jesus was anointed by God and he went around doing good, healing all that was oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Healing all that was oppressed, right? It was the will of God where Jesus couldn't do miracles was where they what? Had unbelief, right? And so, so we know that in this room, it's full of faith and power and belief. Hallelujah. And so let's keep on walking here. So we're, we know that it is the will of God. Hallelujah. The word is the promise of the healing. So he sent his word and he healed them and he delivered them. That's Psalm 107, 20, right? He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. <laughs> so we already did it. So we need to walk in it. Amen. So whatever is hindering us, God's going to reveal it and break it so we can receive what it is that he has for us. Hallelujah. God is able to do that. He is able to do that. Hallelujah. Revelations 22. <clears throat> Remember, if something is not happening, it's not on God's side. It's on ours. Right? And so the people of God must seek God and must begin to get hungry for the things of God. So if you're not hungry for the things of God, you're not going to receive them. Jesus always told us, ask, seek, knock, right? Ask, seek, knock. He told us the parable of the unjust judge. And Jesus is like, am I going to find faith when the Son of Man comes? Is there going to be that kind of faith, right? Well, there is faith in the earth because he's still moving in the earth. And so Revelations 22 it says in verse one, it says, or four and five, then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and of the lamb in the middle of his street. On either side of the river was the tree of life bearing the 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations and they were no longer be any curse. Praise the Lord, right? And we're going to stop right there. So this is a beautiful picture of the river of God and the tree of life that flows through and is, live, is, is alive in the New Jerusalem, right? Guess what? We have access by the Holy Spirit. We sang about the river tonight. We sang about him, didn't we? And so, and that wasn't planned. And so I come into the office, I was telling Elder, I come into the office and I kept healing, healing, healing waters, healing waters, you know. So I come in there and I don't even have this on my, uh, on my iTunes. And so I just thought, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm in the office, I'm going to put on some, I like instrumental, you know. I was just listening to some instrumental worship. And what pops up on my phone, I don't even have this on my phone, healing waters. I said, all right, Jesus, I hear you. So, so we're going to release some healing waters in Jesus' name. And so we have access by the Spirit of God. This river, river is crystal clear. It's pure water, unlike any earthly water, right? It is supernatural. <laughs> it's a supernatural river. 
powerful. So it has supernatural qualities of purity, richness, provision, and peace. Purity. All right? So it doesn't depend on you because we know God is forever changing us, right? But it's pure. It's rich, right? It has provision, whatever I need, and it has peace. In Psalm 46, 4 and 5, it says, There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Hallelujah. That's for us. There's a river flowing Amen. The river of God that flows through us. Isaiah 12. Let's just talk about this well of Yeshua that's inside of us. The Holy Spirit. Amen. That's how you have access to God. That's how we feel him. We hear him. The Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 12. I love Isaiah 12. It says, let's go to verse 2. Well, let's go up to 1. It says, Then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord. God is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. He said, therefore, he says, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. That word salvation means Yeshua Jesus. Hallelujah. He says, and in that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the people. He said, make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song for he has done excellent things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Cry aloud and shout for joy, O habitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Hallelujah. The well of Yeshua, that word Yeshua, Jesus, means deliverance. It means healings. It means all that I have need of. What do you have need of today? I can name a list, right? All that I have need of. The well of Yeshua down on the inside of me, of you, because you have him in there. Hallelujah. He says, therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. So Jesus was speaking in John 7, 37. He cries out and he said, if anyone is thirsty, right, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being, I just read about this well, right? From this innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water flows out of us. By the spirit of God flows the healing waters of God. So, Father, we thank you that you're opening up healing waters out of this river right now that's on the inside of us. Flow out. Touch bodies in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We receive it, Lord. We receive it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's go to Genesis 26. Sometimes these wells get stopped up. Come on. Sometimes this well gets a little clogged up and stopped up and God has to come in and that's what deliverance is. And he unlocks it and he unplugs it and he gets things out of the way so the blessings of God can flow through us. Amen. And to us. Uh Uh-huh. That's how it works. Genesis 26. Let's walk there. We're talking about these wells. You know the story if you've read it, and if you need to read probably the whole chapter here. In Genesis 26, when Isaac settles in in Gier, right? Let me go to verse 1. It says, Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gier and to Ambimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land which I shall tell you. 
He says, sojourn in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants, I will, I will give you these lands and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father, Abraham. So he's in this process. And, and can you imagine? God says, stay in the famine. Stay in the famine. <laughs> he had to trust God in the famine. God could have sent him to a place where there was, but no, God said, you stay where I put you. You're in the process here, right? And he said, and I will multiply your descendants. So God was not insensitive that he was living in a famine place. He still had a plan for him. Amen. There was still a promise of generational blessings that needed to be released, right? That's for us. See, there's things that have been held up in our life. And I know preachers say that all the time, but it is true. There are things that are over us and things in our bloodline and blessings that need to be released. But there's these squatters sometimes, these hindrances that are in the way. He says, I will, verse 4, I will multiply your descendants and the stars of heaven and will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. See, don't give up on those prodigal children. You obey the Lord. See, you obey God. You stand in faith and you continue to obey the Lord and watch what God does with your seed. Amen? You be faithful. He said, so the men of the place asked about his wife, and he said, she is my sister, for he was afraid to say, my wife, thinking the men of the place might kill me on account of Rebecca, for she is beautiful. Quite interesting that this is a generational cycle. If you go back to Genesis 20, he did what his daddy did, <laughs> right? But the mercy of God, <laughs> the mercy of God. He repeated the same story that his father did. He lied. He lied. The mercy of God. And so if you keep, we're going to keep walking here. And so he did that. And, and so anyway, he got caught in the lie. And so the king told the people, don't touch this woman. I'm paraphrasing all of that. And let's go to verse 12. Now Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. Hallelujah. So he sowed in a famine and he still reaped and the Lord blessed him even after he sinned and lied. Come on. The mercy of God. We just don't understand the depths of God's mercy. When there's a purpose and a plan, the mercy of God is tremendous. It's past our searching out. Because we all know in this room, how did God choose us, right? <laughs> his love and his mercy. And it says, and the, and, it, and the man became rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy. And he had possessions of flocks and herds and great households so that the Philistines envied him. He said, now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with earth. Let's look at that. So it says he, that the Philistines, the enemy, filled his wells with earth, right? And then it says in verse 18, it says, And Isaac dug, well, if we go up a little bit, he begins to, um, the king says, Go away from us, you're too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Ger, and he settled there. Then Isaac dug again the wells of water, which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he gave them the same names which his father had given them. He said, but when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well flow of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gear quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, the water is ours. So he named the well, he said, Isaac, because they contended with him. And then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one too, and he named it Sitna. Now, those names mean contention and hostility, okay? The names of the well is contention and hostility. It clogged up the water. It clogged up the wells that was inside of us. You remember I talked about our words, our mouth, and how we speak, and how we, the things that we say, even as a child of God, 
that tongue iniquity that James 3 talks about, it's very, very serious. Curses, word curses, things that people speak, all of that, it clogs up the well. It clogs up those things from, from coming out, and it's very difficult. Offenses clogs it up. There was contention. There was offenses. There was strife, all of those things. And we think about how we allow the enemy sometimes to snare us in a trap. He snares us in offenses. Okay? So when you're a child of God and there's somebody that just won't forgive you, there's somebody that still slanders and gossips about you. You must understand that that is a demonic assignment against you. It's a test for you for real, but it is a demonic assignment sent to take you out to stop the well, to clog it up, to make you sick. It's the truth. It's very, very real. So many times these things, these contracts is what I call them, spiritual contracts on our life of bitterness and contention and strife and all of that, they have been sent on assignment to steal and to stop your purpose and your destiny because it's a huge, huge snare. It's a trap. The word offense means scandal, scandaling. It means I'm snared in a scandal. <laughs> it means I'm in a trap. And, and it also means to be snared by irritation. Think about how people irritate us sometimes, don't they? You better forgive them. You better forgive them when they irritate you. That is the beginning. <laughs> that irritation is a little hook in your heart. It's a, little, it's a little snare. And when it first starts, you can get out the snare because Psalm says, like a fowler, he, sa he says, deliver yourself like the gazelle, right? Get out of that. Get out of that snare. How do you do it? You forgive them and release them. It ain't worth it. It's not worth it to be clogged up and to hinder your healing, to hinder your prosperity, to hinder your deliverance, it ain't worth it, right? And so because you are anointed by God, people are going to come and they're not going to like you. It's true. They're not going to like you. And it can be even in your own house. You will have conflicts. The enemy doesn't care. The devil don't care. He don't care. He will use whoever he can use. It can be your children. It can be your spouse. It can be your pastor, <laughs> unfortunately. It can be anybody. Your, your siblings, come on, tell the truth, right? So you have to hear me by the Spirit that you got to pay attention that demons are behind conflicts. The Bible says we don't wrestle against what? Flesh and blood. That, that person is not my enemy. It's what's inside their mind. It's the spiritual stronghold that's controlling their mouth. Okay? So you got to war good warfare and learn to bind up those things. Come on. You got to bind that thing up. You got to continue to cast down your imaginations. You don't want to get even. You don't want revenge. Come on. That's the way of the heathen. You forgive and let God deal with it. That's what you do, and you have to do that even on this weekend. You need to write some letters to some people that you need to forgive. Write a letter. You don't have to give it to them. Everybody like, oh, so most of them don't even know you're still holding on forgiveness because sometimes people will snare you. They'll offend you. They keep on living, you know, and there's a lot of miscommunication, and the enemy comes in. He traffics us when there's not good communication or no communication, Right? And so you need to write a letter just for this weekend. And when we do these prayers on tomorrow afternoon, you're going to rip up those letters and release these people to the Lord. So you, those, those letters are going to bring some healing to your heart. Okay? They're very important. They're good tools. And the Holy Spirit will use those letters. Okay? And so when you begin to write and all of these things begin to come out of you, you're saying, oh, man, I didn't even know that was in there. People say that all the time, and I'm like, Jesus knew it was in there <laughs> because he goes down into the depths of us. He knows every little thing in there, and so you begin to write it out. Yes, you hurt me when I was eight. Yes, when I was 10, you crushed me, or it could have been last year, yesterday, today, right? 
but you're but the Holy Spirit's going to highlight some things that have clogged up this well of Yeshua on the inside of you and it could be many things it could be an abuse a trauma anything like that it could be word curses it could be a disappointment a failure many people are angry at themselves okay they can't forgive themselves that's a clog well you got to forgive yourself to receive from the Lord if he's forgiven you and he has if you've repented he's faithful and just to cleanse us to wash us to purify us amen and so he doesn't go fishing for the things that you're still holding on to he doesn't go out there and get a fishing pole in the sea of forgetfulness and pull up all your dirty stuff thank the Lord right He's, he, he chooses to forget those things because of love, and we have to forgive ourselves. Sometimes it's, many times it's easier to forgive someone else, but to look in the mirror every day and let the old accuser try and talk to you and tell you, you know, about you, but you got to cast him down because he is defeated. The blood of Jesus speaks better than his accusations, and it cries mercy forgiveness freedom it's over so you have to rise up and do that and that's one of your exercises for this weekend is write those letters you might have one or two you might have 10 you might have 20 some people write a paragraph some people brought in stacks this thick for real I was like wow what a cleansing (laughs) because they got rid of those things you know because it was snaring them and hindering them so thank God for Jesus. Hallelujah. So, so do your letters of forgiveness. Forgive yourself. Write down, I forgive myself for. It's all in your white booklet. You will see the exercises in there. And so you read that tonight, and you have time tomorrow to do your homework, okay? Nobody's going to read that. That's between you and the Lord. Those are private. I forgive myself for you. List those things. And when we do these prayers, we're going to rip them up and release that. And, and I'm telling you, yokes are broke, and you'll feel the breaking even as you're riding. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And so let's shift a little bit here, okay? And so... By the Spirit of God flows the healing water. So there's a lot of grief and sorrow in God's people. Some of this grief is known, and some people don't even know why they're sad. Some people have depression and don't even know why. Because many times we have suppressed areas of trauma. We have places where we have been wounded as a child, and we've just kept on plowing through that and lived the best we can. So, there, so many people are locked in places of trauma, abuse, suffering, word curses, all of those things like that can cause people to, to have a sorrowful spirit and a spirit of heaviness. It could be a lost loved one. That's why I really wanted to teach on grief tonight, and I am, because there's all of these people that have lost loved ones Dear God, and we just pray for people to be healed. Amen. For people to be healed. And so it's it's suppressed. It's suppressed things sometimes. Sometimes you know what it is. Sometimes you don't. I went through a season like that where I was depressed. All This was after I was married and had some of my children. And I didn't know why I was depressed until God brought a prophet had to tell me because I didn't know I didn't know why I was struggling with all that sadness when I should have been happy I had a wonderful husband I had children I doing ministry all these things but I had so much depression but then but, but God sent the prophet he sent the word and he spoke into my childhood things that I have forgotten see that's what the anointing will do on this weekend the anointing will bring up some things that need to be dealt with things that you have forgotten okay and guess what the grace is there for you to see it that's the beauty of Jesus (laughs) you remember the woman at the well come and see this man told me everything I ever did and she was a great evangelist he healed her he walked through her life okay all those husbands right come on he walks through her life and ministers love and healing to this woman. And when he did that, she became free. She, she got her healing. So he spent time with her. 
And so that's what the Lord does. His love will come in and it will show you some things that you have forgotten. It will also show you some vows you have made in your own heart. And so we make these vows. We make these bitter root judgments against people and all of that. And so God has to come in and he has to show you those things because the enemy uses those things as a legal right to keep you trapped. We got to get out of his traps. Come on. Uh huh. <laughs> She's like, I'm on, I'm on it. <laughs> yeah. And God's been doing a deep work. I mean, he does a deep work in people. If they want to go deep, he will go deep. Amen. And so suppress things, all that trauma, all those things. And he knows how to handle it and he will. And so even if it is suppressed, we're talking about grief, even if those things are suppressed, it will cause your body to be sick, all right? Even if you don't understand why, where did this autoimmune come from, this immune disease? I, nobody in my family has it, and all of a sudden, I have it. There's something hidden in there. It's probably an experience, a trauma, some kind of abuse. It, something has happened that has opened the door, all right? Luke 21, 26 says, men fainting from fear and the expectation of things which are coming upon the world, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So men's hearts fail them for fear, fear and bitterness, right? And, and you know, we have, we have that little diagram in the book because it's very true. You have the roots of rejection, which is in the foundation. Usually we're born, you know, rejections in us a lot of times from our family line or it could be from society culture peers experiences y'all know and then and then as rejection is rooted as a child then it grows out and you have fear and you have pride in our lives and those things are very real and those are also areas of sickness unforgiveness bitterness and then fear and anxiety opens the door to many many things that people suffer in their bodies Autoimmune diseases is fear and anxiety, stress, unloving, unnurturing spirits, all of those things, arthritis, unforgiveness. It could be toward others or toward yourself. And that spirit of arthritis, that what happens is the offense or the, the hurt that was sinned against you, right? People sinned against you. They hurt you, all of that. And when we're growing up, many times, you know, we don't understand to forgive we weren't taught those things many times and we didn't have a revelation and so the enemy comes in when we're young or comes in during that experience or that trauma in our mind but as we continue to have that and we push that and we pack that down in our system okay you got to hear me this is a spiritual thing and so it gets inside of us and those things get rot. Uh, bitterness is like rottenness to the bones, the Bible says. Envy and jealousy, rotten to the bones. All of those things. And, and there's many scriptures about our physical health connected to our soul health. And, it's, and if it didn't happen to you, you inherit that through the bloodline. Okay? It gets continuously passed down. So we see many people uh, get delivered and healed in their body from arthritic strongholds and spirits and all of that and so the definition of grief okay means a keen mental suffering or a distress over affliction or loss okay it could be a hardship and injustice a bodily affliction also a grievance a grievance a wrong considered as grounds for complaint or something believed to cause distress a resentment so we're speaking of grief and when I say grief most of the time we think sorrow okay but I'm going to show you where grief brings bitterness <clears throat> okay Jeremiah 45 3 says woe is me for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain I am weary with my groanings and I found no rest and so you see when you're speaking about this word grief even in the Hebrew okay which even goes deeper it's a meaning a sense of weakness sickness it equates grief with sickness pain physical emotionally and spiritually speaking 
See, we got to stop grieving about things. We got to release the things of the past, grieving over our children, grieving over a failure, grieving over a marriage, grieving over just all kinds of things, right? Because it does bring sickness in the body. So um, another scripture, Psalm 3110 says, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength has failed because of my iniquity and my body has wasted away. Okay, let's go to Psalm 6. I'm just going to write all these down because it really does affect you. We've seen people um, that would be a root to an illness or a sickness was a grieving heart, a sick heart that was sick with grief. So in Psalm chapter 6, and you know infirmities come in through trauma too. A lot of times asthma will come in through a trauma or through abandonment and a deep abandonment and rejection, a spirit of asthma, which also brings in death, all right? And it, and it hides in the lungs. And so these spirits, although they are, because a demon is a tormentor of the mind, obviously, you know a spirit by its nature, how it makes you feel, what it makes you do when it, when it controls you, right? And so, but also, even though it is a tormentor of the mind, it lodges in the flesh, in your physical house, in this body. It wants to dwell in the house. And Paul talks about it being in your members, right? And so arthritis, even though arthritis is a spirit, and it's rooted in the stronghold of unforgiveness, it lodges and it coils and it wraps around what? The bones. It's a crippling spirit. And it wants to dry up and cripple the bones, bone diseases, all of those things. And the devil is defeated. Hallelujah. Because light is shining in dark places. So in Psalm 6, in verse 7, it says, my eye has wasted away with grief. It has become old because of my adversary. He said, depart from me, all you who do iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord receives my prayer. Thank God. And all my enemies will be ashamed and greatly dismayed. They will turn back and they will suddenly be ashamed so he says my eye is wasted away with grief see in a new tr a living translation says my vision is blurred by grief right he said in my eyes are worn out because of all my enemies see so if you think about that and so you can't have a spiritual vision when you're grieving. When you have a spirit of grief, you, could, you can't see past the pain. Your spiritual vision will be what? Clouded. It will be blurred. You won't have it. And so that ha God has to break that off. The pain of weariness and toil, we read that in Psalm 31.10. Um, and also Jeremiah read that earlier, 45, three speaks of sorrow with pain. So there's a lot of people in the body of Christ with emotional pain. We hear it all the time. We do cleansings all over and the body of Christ is full of pain. And so God brings up the emotional pain and people will just begin to weep and they'll begin to cry and cry out. Why? Because that pain has been locked in their soul, locked tight in there because most of us if we tell the truth we were told just get over it get over it you know well I need some healing here <laughs> I need some help to get over it and Jesus does that Holy Spirit comes and he heals those places you know when Hannah said to Eli whenever you remember when Hannah wanted the baby in, in, in the Bible, she was crying. It says, Hannah said to Eli, out of the abundance of my complaint and my grief, have I spoken? So there was a vexation in her heart and her soul. So it wasn't just grief, but, but it also, that word means she was angry and irritated. 
it wasn't just about sorrow. She was angry. She was irritated at that, wanting that baby. Come on. Isaiah 53, 3 and 4, Jesus, what? What did he do? He carried our sorrows, right? He did that for us. He took our pain and our suffering. So we're releasing that to him. We're not carrying that anymore. And so we have to, we have to maintain that when we release that. And I'm going to teach you how to do that. So the word also indicates, as I said, grief indicates bitterness coming out of hurt and pain. Prolonged grief brings a bitter spirit. All right. Prolonged grief. The longer people are grieving, they become bitter in their soul. Proverbs 14, 10, another scripture says, the heart knows its own bitterness and a stranger does not share its joy. The heart knows. So this word implies a stumbling and a staggering offense. The heart knows its own stumbling and staggering offense. It means to snare one's soul. And so grief and pain unhealed snares us in all areas of our life, our spirit, soul, and our body. Thank you, Jesus, for freedom. And so the spirit of grief affects our hope, our dreams, our thoughts, our attitudes, destiny, everything. To be grieved is, is connected to being vexed, to be angry, to be tired, People that are grieving, they're tired, they're weary, they're faint-hearted. All right? Where's your strength? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Another scripture for you, Psalm 73, 21 through 26 says, and I write these out because there's so many, right? So that's why I'm going so quickly. <laughs> Psalm 73, 21 through 26 says, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered. You see how it's connected together? When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, he says, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me. See, the spirit of counsel can come in. He will heal you, and he will counsel you, and he will guide you up out of that. Yes. And afterward, receive to me glory. You see what happens? He, he replaces that with his glory. Amen. He heals us. He binds us back together. He says, whom have I in heaven but you? He said, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is my strength of my heart and the portion forever. Hallelujah. Christ came to comfort all those who mourn. It says in Isaiah 61, right? So you see in the earth, especially when times of uncertainty, where people don't think they have hope, but we know they do, right? God is alive, Isaiah 61 says the spirit of the Lord, when Jesus quoted this in Luke 14, he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. So there is a binding back together when we are broken. Many people are shattered. Many people are fractured today in church. And I know we're the church, but you know what I'm saying. God's people, shattered, fractured, broken. Many of them are because they, they need the, the healing and the, the deliverance of Jesus. They need that in their life. Amen. And so you know a tree by its fruit. And you know, spirit, how it makes you feel. You know when you're afflicted in your heart. You know when you got sickness in your body. He said to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. He said to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified hallelujah that's what we expect 
when God heals us, when he delivers us, he, he puts us, he restores us greater than we were. All right. And then it says, after he does these things, the planting of the Lord, he plants us that, that he may be glorified through us. And it says, then they will rebuild the ancient ruins and they will raise up former devastations and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. The whole chapter is wonderful about the promise of God, right? And so that is for our children's children. And so with the spirit of fainting, when grief is there, people don't have a vision. They can't see past the pain. And you'll know when it's still there because you'll, you'll reminisce. Your mind will go back there and you'll feel sorrow and you'll feel pain. And you'll be in a quiet moment and you might begin to weep and, you're in, and you experience it yet again. That's that uh, post-traumatic stress, right? All of that. God delivers people from those images because what happens is post-traumatic stress and also like pornea, all of those are spirit images because fear is a spirit. Come on. It's a spirit. And so those images, when, when trauma happens, the image gets locked in your mind, right? And it gets in the imagination. It gets in that part of you, in the flesh man, but in your, in your, even though it's your soul, but it gets locked in there and because he, the devil is a liar. He's a spirit. He's coming to still kill and destroy your peace because that's what they do. They torment us. And so when people have those flashes and those images, they feel that in their body as if they were there. Triggers, come on, cycles, triggers, all of those things, spiritual. They're spiritual, and demons will work hard to create triggers for you. Mm -hmm. He will. They'll work very hard to create a conflict or a scenario, something to get you to have a setback. Because they know that thing is still in there. They communicate. Mm -hmm. They communicate. They, they're, they're not ignorant. They communicate. They have knowledge, familiar spirits. They're, they're assigned to us. They're in our families. They know the history of our life. They don't die. But they will be gone when Jesus said it's over. Hallelujah. <laughs> Okay, their doom is coming. And that's why you're seeing so much conflict in the earth right now is because as heaven's coming down, Jesus is coming back. All of hell is out of control. The time is shorter. We don't know when, but it's shorter. So you're going to see a lot more of these things. But you got to understand that those those triggers and all of those things, Jesus can break the snares. He can break the triggers. He can deliver you from spirit images of trauma. He's done it to many people, many people. So there's no more triggers anymore. They can be around a certain type of people or go to a certain place and they're fine. Because there's nothing in common anymore in them with the evil. You remember Jesus said in John 14, 30, that the prince of this world is coming. Talking about Satan was coming after him. He said, I don't have anything in common with him. Nothing. There was nothing in Jesus. He was pure. He was sinless. There was nothing in common that Satan could get him. He laid down his life. Come on. The devil couldn't touch him. He gave him permission, right? And so we as children of the kingdom, we don't need anything in common with the enemy. We don't want to entertain those things. We got to come out of that, and God will give us grace to do that. And he, he frees us and he heals us. Hallelujah. And so grief is a natural response to losing someone. I'm going to give you a few points here. It's a natural response, of course, to losing someone or something that's important to you. God is not insensitive. He gave us emotions and feelings. Come on. We have a soul man to live in the earth. <laughs> he wanted us to enjoy emotions and all of that. Everything he created was perfect and good. Okay. But 
what happens is, is we go past this mourning stage into grieving. We, we stay too long there. And that's when grief comes in. God only really gave them like 30 days in the Bible, which ain't very long, is it? But we don't grieve like those that don't have hope, right? We're alive in Christ. We don't even say death in here when a saint dies. We say they transitioned. They transitioned to another realm. And they're, they're alive. They're in the cloud, right? Come on. And so... There's a denial at first. The, this, is, this is what they'll tell you in, in stages of grief. There's denial, the shock, the numbness. Is this really real, right? And some of you probably know all of these points. Then there's anger that comes. And, you know, George and I know this. We've had, we've had some trauma and some grief, you know, like probably everybody in this room and listening. Anger at the reality that it is real frustration helplessness comes and not being able to change the situation the third thing is bargaining the you, you know that what if spirit you know we cast out the what if spirits the real that's a tormenting demon what if what if what if if only if only and over and over again in the mind that will play and it'll give you a picture, right? Just like fear paints a picture. Uh huh. Fear is a lying spirit. It's an illusion. It tries to premeditate something in your mind, get you to believe it, get you to think about it, get you to dwell on it long enough because it knows if you dwell upon it because you have this creative power called the Holy Spirit. But if you begin to dwell on the negative things and you begin to dwell, you're going to attract what you fear. It will come upon you. Jesus said it. Men's hearts will fail them for fear of what is coming upon the earth. Right? That's what Elijah did when he hid from Jezebel and he ran. You know, he heard there was a messenger. That was a curse that came to him. It was a spirit that came into him and spoke into this great prophet. You're going to be like one of the prophets you killed tomorrow. You're going to die. I'm going to kill you. All the things that he did, he allowed, he listened to that spirit of witchcraft fear. He listened to it, and it got into his psyche. It got into his mind. And it painted him a picture and all the prophets that he killed and all the things that he did. That one word curse from the witch had some power behind it. A demonic spirit spoke. And instead of him, as he did before, he would, he would do everything God told him to do. And, and God moved, I mean, powerfully all those chapters, but he entertained the witchcraft fear and he flees for his life and hides in a cave. Come on now. That's what, that's what the devil does. Remember, it's suggestions for us to believe. So we meditate on the suggestion of the negativity, of the hate, of the fear. We meditate on it. We think about it. So man thinks in his heart, so is he. And the longer we do it, it, it at first, it's, we, we cast it down. We repent for these bad thoughts. But I'm telling you, the longer you stay with a toxic mind, that toxic spirit is coming in. And it'll set up in you. That's what happens. That's why strongholds, it's a lie we believe as truth. And we be, once we believe the lie, and then the devil tells us more lies connected to that lie, and it fortifies that lie. Then you got a stronghold. And where there's a stronghold, it's a place where a demon rules. That's why so many people get delivered of fear and rejections and insecurities and all those things because they believe the lie of the enemy. Thank you, Jesus. And so bargaining, what ifs. We got to get over the what ifs. You might have had a bad marriage. What if I would have done this? And if only I would have, what if? Nope, no more. We're going, that's right, we're going to cast that down. We're going to get rid of what ifs and if onlys, right? Blaming yourself. I could have prevented it from happening and all of those things. And I'm not being insensitive, but I want you to see spiritually where that holds you. It holds you in your past. 
And as a child of the kingdom, we're to put our hands to the plow and not look back. And that's, that takes some discipline, doesn't it? <laughs> but we have the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And he'll help us. And so if we do the what ifs and all of that, then comes the spirit of depression. Then you are sad. They're crying. Sleep issues. They can't sleep. I read those scriptures. There ain't no rest. You know, um, none, they get lonely. Loneliness comes in, which is lying because you're not alone. You have the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and angels, all of heaven, a cloud of witnesses. The devil is a liar. You are not alone. Come on. Friends. And number five, acceptance. You know, but the only bad thing about when it says the last stage is finally people accept it. What I find is even though they accept it and they settle it, if they haven't got healed, they got some strongholds in there. That's why we as children of the kingdom, God heals us. We understand the healing process. And so 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, don't grieve as do the rest who have no hope. He said, when mourning is not resolved and healed, grief can affect us physically. Here's some areas that grief bothers our system. Digestive issues. People get weight gain or weight loss. A grieving soul will put on weight. Why? You're trying to comfort yourself. And so a lot of times when we comfort ourselves, our flesh with who? Come on, we know. You know, we comfort, we, we need comfort, so we feed that, right? But that's not good. And, and or it's the opposite. People starve themselves, right? And so that's one of the issues, digestive issues. Uh, fatigue. It causes our body to be tired, right? We know depression brings a whole nest. And so demons never work alone. They work in a group. They work in a nest, okay? And so when we do cleansings, we go down the stronghold. There'll be, there'll be different strongholds. And we start with the roots, and we go all the way down with rejections and fears and prides and um, the witchcrafts and all of those things, the whoredom spirits, all of that. Iniqu uh, iniquities and infirmities, all of those things. And so, and bitterness, of course. And they also, the next thing is digestive fatigue. They affect the immune system. You are more susceptible to diseases if you have grief and sorrow. You know, even in the world today, they tell people, and people have told me this. The doctor says you need to forgive and you'll feel better. <laughs> Isn't that something? They're using, they're using a lot of the tools, you know, thank God, because God wants his people healed. Come on. And so you're more susceptible to diseases. It also brings fear and nervousness. Okay. It brings physical pain from emotional pain. We find all the time when people get emotionally healed, because we'll call out physical pain, it will leave their bodies. It's so powerful. So emotional pain is connected many times to the physical pain. Okay? They work together. People with, you know, a lot of pressure, heavy and bad backs and all those kind of, they're carrying too much stuff. Okay? Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desired fulfilled is a tree of life. <laughs> Proverbs 17, 22, another one, I'm almost through, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. You see that? So a joyful heart, you can have a joyful heart. See, happiness is temporal. Happiness is a moment, okay? Something good happened. I'm happy today, right? But joy is an eternal attribute that comes from the Lord. It is powerful. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I can go through things in the earth, but I keep my joy in knowing my God and my relationship, and I have hope. See, when I have hope, I have joy, right? Even in a hard place, it's different. So happiness is earthly. Joy is eternal. Amen. And that's why it says it's medicine to us. 
In 1 Samuel 16, 1, whenever, um, when God chose David, okay, a lot of people have church hurt. We know we've been shepherding for years. Church hurt is real. People have been wounded, broken, bitter, unfulfilled expectations. That's the biggest thing. Uh, all of those things. And so God asked the prophet, he said, how long will you grieve over Saul? <laughs> he said, how long? Right. And so I'm telling you, whenever there is uh, ministry grief, um, it, it, it causes, it stifles you. Okay. It paralyzes you and, and your purpose. It paralyzes your purpose. And it stifles you, it'll plateau you, and you will drop off. And so you must deal with church hurt in cleansing. And most of it is offenses and unfulfilled expectations. We put people and leaders sometimes in the place of God. We are human beings, okay? And so, yes, there's a gift, yes, there's an anointing, but we're still people, right? And, and, and we judge sometimes, people will judge leaders, you know, and this, and I'm saying church hurt, but we can do this in any part of, you know, of our life. But we judge our leaders and you shouldn't do that because you, nobody knows until you walk in people's shoes what it's like when you have to shepherd souls. That's hard. It's not an easy job. You must be called to do that. But even in that, nobody's perfect. And so in, in cleansings, People need to forgive their pastors. They need to forgive church leaders. They need to forgive their, their uh, church family. <laughs> There's a lot of bitterness in churches toward one another, right? And so just because someone's anointed, they're still human. They still cut, bleed, cry. Come on, just like you do. They have families. They have needs. They have, you know, all those things. And so you can be held up in your purpose and really grieve God and cross the line and get in some trouble with that because God called them, you know. And so release people, release your uh, former pastors. We, we always check our uh, church doctrine, our church history. When our mapping's and our cleansing, you'd be, you be, you know, you probably wouldn't be surprised, but all the churches that people have been to, you know, just so many churches, so many churches, so many churches. And each church, there's an offense. Each church, there's a pain. Each church, there's an there's a unfulfilled expectation or maybe an abuse because some leaders are abusive, right? So each place, there's some kind of wound in them. And God never intended for be like that. And so that's an area, even when you're writing your letters and getting rid of grief, church disappointment and pain. You know, deal with that. Release these people. Hallelujah. Because you don't want to be one that refuses to be comforted. Do you know people are like that? They're stubborn. They refuse God's comfort. That's not a good place to be. Psalm 77. In verse 1, it says, My voice rises to God, and I will cry aloud. My voice rises to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. In the night, my hand was stretched out without weariness. But look what he said. My soul refused to be comforted. Wow. That's something, isn't it? That's a stubborn, bitter spirit. Pride. Pride refuses comfort. And guess what God does with the proud? He resists them. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He knows you're hurting. So when we humble ourselves and we choose to forgive, he pours out this grace over our life. It's wonderful. Healing can come. Wholeness can come. Peace. <laughs> Peace comes when we do that. And so, thank God. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, you can write that down. It's a scripture that says, sorrow of the world has regrets. OK, but no change of mind. Remember, there's godly repentance. Right. And then there's this worldly sorrow. You can read that scripture. That's what Esau had. He did. He wasn't repented that he despised his birthright. Everybody thought, man, God must have been harsh because he went out and wept bitterly and everything. And he still didn't get what he wanted. No, it's because he, he did not repent 
to God for despising his birthright. He was sorrowful that he lost the blessing, the, the earthly blessing, but he wasn't looking at the eternal cost of what he did. You see what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Very different. Many times, we, it's like this. You have children. We raise some. You tell them, don't get in the cookie jar. You got to have dinner, right? And so they keep, put, they keep sneaking in and getting the cookies out of the cookie jar. But, but you go in there and you catch them with their hand in that, you know, and they just cry and cry. They're not crying because, <laughs> you know, they feel bad or they've repented to mama for getting in the cookie jar. They're crying because they want another cookie. You know what I'm saying? They got caught stealing the cookie. <laughs> they, they're, not, they're not upset that they were disobedient in the first place. You see, it's different. God sees it when people really repent from the heart. There's a change. There's a shift in their attitude. It's different. And, oh, and God can see that in our fruit and our behavior. Sometimes we can hide it from other people, but you can never hide it from God because when I see Esau going out and crying and all the things that he did, and he said he sought it, but he could not have it back because there was not true repentance. And you see Peter, who was sifted, he did that three times. But Peter, he went out and wept bitterly too, He was restored. He meant what he did. He was repentant to the heart for betraying his Lord. It it tore him up that he hurt God like that. Totally different spirit, isn't it? See, God can see. But if you look at it, they both did the same thing. But they had a different attitude. They had a different spirit behind the tears. Mm Mm-hmm. So those, anyway, just throwing that out there. In closing, hallelujah. They say I have three closes. This is my third and last close. (laughs) So Proverbs 14, 12, and 13. Even if laughter of heart may be in pain and the end of joy may be grief. Okay? So I have more and more, but maybe we'll work on it tomorrow because I don't want to wear you out. But so anyway, I do want you to work on some letters, all right? And then we'll we'll be back at 3 o'clock. I want you to really seek God. Areas of pain, areas of grief, all right? Maybe it was a failure. Maybe there was something you you say, you know, I missed that open door. It could be anything. You know, whatever that is, we're going to release those things. We're going to write out. We're going to release people from unforgiveness, uh, ourselves from unforgiveness, Because, see, God is a restorer of years. Praise the Lord. Only God can do that. He restores years. He restores family, everything, opportunities, missed opportunities. That's why he says your ladder will be greater than your past. He already knew we were going to mess it up. So he sent Jesus to restore us. There's still still time for us to be obedient and do the things he's called us to do. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Can I have five minutes? <laughs> no, this is this is it for real. <laughs> I was like, because I just heard the Holy Spirit. You got to give them the end. Okay. And so <laughs> these are signs, though, that you're incomplete. You're not healed. If you still get angry and irritable, okay, about that situation, If you're obsessed about the loss of a thing, all right, and this is all recorded and you can watch it again. If you have hyper alertness, a fear of loss and anxiety, I'm still talking about grief, right? Or if you have um, behavioral overreactions, those triggers that I talked about, that means there's still some incompleteness there that God needs to touch. If you have addictions or self-harm issues, obviously, numbness or low-grade depression so all of those areas if those areas are still there in your life there's some incomplete um there's some healing that needs to be completed amen 
So do your homework tonight. Do your letters. Do your forgiveness. Um, re those areas of grief. So go ahead and stand up, and we're just going to.